Good evening. That was weak. It's been a long day. How are you all doing? Praise the Lord. What a wonderful experience it is to be here at GYC. I've been to many of them. And uh, every single one has been a huge blessing to my own spiritual walk with the Lord. Before we begin our study together this evening, we do want to ask for the Lord's special blessing. And so I invite you reverently to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father and our God, your people are gathered here in this holy place to open your holy book pleading for the help of the Holy Spirit to help us understand the message that you have for us. We ask, Father, that you will manifest your power in this place, that Christ might be seen in all of his glory, and we might be inspired to follow in his footsteps. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of approaching your throne boldly, and we do so because we come in the powerful and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In our study this evening, I would like us to focus on the last three words that Jesus spoke to his Father when he was on the cross of Calvary. Those three words that Jesus spoke were the following. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Words that are found in Matthew 27 and verse 46. The second saying that I would like us to focus on is very short. It's found in John chapter 19 and verse 30, where Jesus cried out, It is finished. And the third word of Christ that I would like to focus on is the last that Jesus spoke from the cross. The words, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Those words are found in Luke 23 and verse 46. But before we focus on these three words of Jesus from the cross at the end of his life, we need a little bit of background of things that happened immediately before. In order to understand what happened before, we need to comprehend something about the Old Testament sanctuary service. When an individual sinned in Israel, they would bring an animal to the court of the sanctuary. They would place their hand upon the head of that animal, whether it be a lamb or a goat or another type of animal, and they would confess their sin on the head of that animal, thus, thus transferring their, their sin from themselves to the animal. In other words, the sin was transferred to the animal while it was alive. The animal bore the sin of the sinner while the animal was alive. And then the animal, of course, was slain. It's significant that the sin was placed on the head of the animal. The head is where our brain is. It's where thinking, reasoning, and feeling occurs. Now I want us to visit the events that took place immediately before the cross. Sometimes we think that the cross tells the whole story. But the events that led up to the cross are just as important as Jesus hanging the cross of Calvary. So let's visit the Garden of Gethsemane. When we think about Jesus bearing the sins of the world, we usually think of Jesus on the cross. But actually the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus, not at the cross, 
but in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'd like us to turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 38. Matthew 26 and verse 38, where Jesus is about to begin his passion in the garden. And he pronounces these words of anguish. Matthew 26, verse 38. Then he said to them, he's speaking to his disciples, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Notice that in this verse we have a connection between sorrow and death. Jesus said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, and it's sorrow that is going to lead ultimately to his death. Now in hard times, we usually look for support from our friends. But Jesus found none. Those he came to save would soon be crying out, crucify him. The disciples whom Jesus begged to pray for him in the garden went to sleep. Judas, whom Jesus called his friend, betrayed the Lord. Peter was denied Jesus, and the last time that he denied Jesus, he did it using vulgar language. In the garden, the disciples would all flee. And that's the reason why we're told in Isaiah 63 and verse 3 that Jesus tread the winepress alone and none were with him. In the seventh volume of the Bible commentary, page 934, Ellen White explains about Jesus. He died outside the camp where felons and murderers were executed. There he trod the winepress alone, bearing the penalty that should have fallen on the sinner. He tread the winepress alone, and none was with him. No earthly support. And we're going to notice that as Jesus hung on the cross, it seemed like even his father forsook him because he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he didn't even feel the support of his own father. Let's follow Jesus now a little closer into the garden. Matthew chapter 26 speaks about a cup that Jesus was going to drink. Three times Jesus uttered a prayer of anguish to his Father. I'd like to read those verses. The first one is verse 39 of Matthew 26. We're told there he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, you can just hear the passion in his voice, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then we're told in verse 42 that Jesus prayed the same prayer again. It says there again a second time, he went away and prayed saying, Oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it. Notice he had to drink what was in the cup. Your will be done. And then we're told in verse 44, so he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Three times Jesus cried out in anguish to his Father to take away the cup if it were possible. And of course, the question is, what was in the cup that was so difficult to drink? The word cup that is used there is the same one that is used in Revelation 16 and verse 19 where we are told that Babylon will drink the wine of the fierceness of God from the cup. So what was in the cup was the wine of God's wrath. And the question is, who gave Jesus that cup with the wine? 
John 18, 11 has the answer. John 18 and verse 11 tells us, this is when Peter took out his sword and cut off the ear of the servant. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? The cup was given to him by his own Father to drink the wine of the wrath of God. That's why we're told in Isaiah 53 and verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord, the Father laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why Jesus suffered such anguish. That's why Jesus felt separated from his Father. In Desire of Ages, page 753, we find these words. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as a conqueror or tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. And now notice this. Christ felt the anguish that the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. He felt like those will feel after the door of probation is closed and they're unsaved. Ellen White continues saying it was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. The book of Hebrews, young people, describes the anguish of Christ. In chapter 5 and verse 7 of the book of Hebrews, we find this description of the anguish of Jesus in Gethsemane. We're told there, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up, listen to the words now, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Notice the words. Prayers, supplications, cries, tears that he uttered to his father. So terrible was his anguish in Gethsemane as the sins of the world were placed upon him that were told in Luke 22 and verse 44 that Jesus sweated great drops of blood. It says there, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like the great drops of blood falling down to the ground. How many of you have ever seen anybody so filled with anguish that instead of sweating sweat, they sweat blood? Perhaps many of you have seen the movie that was produced by Mel Gibson. The Passion of the Christ. You know the big emphasis there, besides the emphasis upon Mary, because really it's a movie about Mary, it's not really a movie about Christ if you look at the subliminal message. But if you look at that movie, the emphasis falls upon the severe beatings that Jesus received. But do you know that Jesus would have died in the garden even before anyone laid a finger upon him? We're told in a document that Ellen White wrote, the Bible training school for September 1st, 1915, human nature would then and there have died under the horror of the sense of sin had not an angel from heaven strengthened him to bear the agony. Human nature would have died. Jesus did not die of his wounds. D Jesus died because the pressure of sin crushed him, crushed his heart. He would have died in the garden before anyone even touched him if it had not been for an angel coming down to strengthen him. 
Now let's take a look at the last three declarations on the cross that Jesus uttered to his Father. In John 8 and verse 29, we're told something about the relationship between Jesus and his Father. Here Jesus speaks and he says, And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. The Father has not left me alone, Jesus said during his ministry. But in Matthew 27 and verse 46, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, the sins have been placed upon him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has drunk the cup of God's wrath. He cries out in anguish from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus cry out those words? Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 321. Ellen White explains, and listen to this. You know, we can't fully understand how Jesus felt. You know, we, we feel the tremendous load of guilt just for our own sins. But Jesus was bearing the guilt of the sins of the whole world upon his conscience. That's why the sin was placed on the head. We're told there in that statement from Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 321, the guilt of every sin pressed its weight upon the divine soul of the world's Redeemer. The evil thoughts, the evil words, the evil deeds of every son and daughter of Adam called for retribution upon himself. How many sins? Once again, the evil thoughts, the evil words, the evil deeds of every son and daughter of Adam called for retribution upon himself, for he had become man's substitute. He said, I'm going to take man's place. I'm going to take the place of every single human being. She continues saying, though the guilt of sin was not his, his spirit was torn and bruised by the transgressions of men. And he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You want to know what his anguish was like? The prophet Isaiah describes it. In Isaiah 53 verses 4 through 6, we find these words, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because of all of our sins, plus the sins that have all ever been committed that were placed upon Jesus Christ in the garden in which he bore to the cross. So now we know why he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But now we need to look at the next declaration to his father on the cross. It is finished. I want to read John chapter 19 and verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now the question is, to whom was Jesus uttering those words? When Jesus said, It is finished, to whom was he speaking? And what had he finished? We need to answer those questions. First of all, we know that Jesus was addressing the Father. The spirit of prophecy makes that absolutely clear that Jesus was saying to his Father, Father, it is finished. But the question is, what was finished? The fact is that Jesus came to this earth for several reasons, but there are two principal reasons. The first reason is that the law of God requires absolute sinless perfection. I'd like to ask this evening, who here can offer the law what the law requires? 
If you said, I can offer it, that's your first sin. Because you're lying. Because the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We are all sinners. We can't offer the law the perfection that the law requires. So Jesus came to this world to live the life that the law requires from all of us. He came to live in our place. He came to weave a robe of perfect righteousness that he could offer to the law in our place. He did that. But he had to do something else. You see, he also had to take care of the problem of sin. And so after Jesus developed his perfect character in harmony with the law and wove a robe of righteousness, then Jesus took upon himself all of our sins and he died on the cross for those sins. He lived for us and he died for us. He lived in our place and he died in our place. And Jesus was saying to his father, Father, it is finished. There is now a perfect robe available. Now I have died for the sins of the whole world. The plan of salvation has met with success. Amen. Now do you know there's this big discussion in Adventist theology as to whether the, the salvation was finished at the cross or not. The fact is that if you read the writings of Ellen White, you, you would seem to find that she's ambiguous when it comes to it. Some places she says that Jesus went to he heaven to finish his work. Other statements she says that he finished it at the cross. The fact is that at the cross Jesus finished the provision for salvation. There was a perfect life and a death for sin available. But he continues his work applying those to those who through repentance and confession and faith in Christ claim what Jesus did. In fact, Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 834, that when Jesus ascended to heaven and met with his Father, he said to his Father, I have completed the work of redemption. Don't misunderstand, he had completed the provision for redemption. But now individuals must claim what Jesus did. Personally, his life and his death as our own. So when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, he was speaking to his father and he was saying, Father, there is now a perfect life and a death for sin that everyone can claim as their own. And then we find the last declaration of Christ on the cross. Luke 23 verse 46 says, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. You know, it's interesting. Jesus felt forsaken by his Father. He had said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But notice that when he dies, he does not die without hope. Because he says to the same father that he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says to the same individual, to the same father, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. What did Jesus mean when he said, I commend my spirit? You know, we usually think of the spirit just as being the breath. But you know, the spirit is the breath along with, with the identity of the person. It is the breath along with their uh, personal identity. In other words, with their character. See, when we die, God keeps a record of our character to give us when we resurrect. So Jesus was saying to his father, Father, preserve my spirit, my character in your record because you promised that if I was successful, you were going to resurrect me. The servant of the Lord in the book Maranatha, page 301, has this remarkable statement. The little old lady understood it. She says, our personal identity is preserved in the resurrection, though not the same particles of matter or material substance as went into the grave. The wondrous works of God are a mystery to man. And now listen carefully. The spirit 
the character of man is returned to God there to be preserved. What is it that's preserved? Only your breath? No. What's preserved is your personal identity, your character, who you were during your life. And then she continues saying, in the resurrection, every man will have his own character. Jesus was saying, Father, you promised that if I was successful, you were going to give me my spirit back. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. Jesus felt forsaken by his Father, but he knew that he was not forsaken. You say, well, how can Jesus feel forsaken and at the same time utter these words of hope? as he's dying. Ellen White explains it in a beautiful way in the Bible Echo, September 15, 1892. She says, But when, in his expiring agonies, despair pressed upon the soul of the Redeemer, he relied upon the evidences that had hitherto, that is up to this point, had been given him of his Father's acceptance. And, he, and as he yielded up his precious life, by faith alone he rested in him whom it had been his joy to obey. He knew his father from previous experience. She continues saying, Though all was enshrouded with gloom, yet amid the awful darkness which was felt even by sympathizing nature, the Redeemer drained the mysterious cup to the dregs. Though he realizes but dimly that he shall triumph. Notice he recognized dimly that he would triumph. He cries with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He is acquainted with the character of his Father. He understands his justice, his mercy, and his great love. He knew his Father from previous experience. He felt separated from his father, but he knew that his father was not separated from him because he knew him from previous experience. She continues saying, in submission, he commends himself to God. Amid the convulsions of nature, the amazed spectators hear the dying words of the Son of Man. It is finished. Jesus died a victorious man. He did not allow anything to discourage him. He was tempted to allow his feelings to dictate the way in which he felt. In fact, Ellen White says that the devil pressed upon his mind that if he went through with this, human beings would not be saved because God's justice would not make it possible and that he would lose himself forever. And yet Jesus did not depend upon his feelings and his thoughts and emo emotions. He depended on the promises of his Father. Because he knew his Father from personal experience. And so Jesus rested in the tomb. Very early the first day of the week, <laughs> two angels descended from heaven. One removed the stone, the other stood before the tomb, and with a loud voice said, O thou Son of God, thy Father calls thee. Do you notice the connection? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The angel comes down and says, Thy Father calls thee. Ellen White describes it. Then the angel from heaven with a loud voice that caused the earth to quake cried out, Thou Son of God, thy Father calls thee. Come forth. And Jesus came forth. His Father fulfilled His promise. Now there's this question, who resurrected Jesus? Was it the Father? Was it the angel? Or was it Jesus Himself? Allow me to read you a statement from Ellen White, and then I'm going to read a passage from John chapter 10. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1114, Ellen White had this to say about Jesus. He who died for the sins of the world was to remain in the tomb the allotted time. 
He was in that stony prison house as a prisoner of divine justice. He was responsible to the judge of the universe. He was bearing the sins of the world and his father only could release him. He was a prisoner of divine justice. Only his father could release him. That's why Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Make sure you call me out as you've promised. Now I know there's a passage that seems to indicate that Christ resurrected himself. But let's read it carefully. John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18. John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18. Here Jesus is speaking. He says, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. See? Jesus took it up. But let's continue reading. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power. The word power is better translated authority. It's the Greek word exousia. It's not dunamis. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Why? Let's finish the verse. This command I have received from my Father. There's the biblical basis for the comment by Ellen White. That he was a prisoner of divine justice, and he relied on the promises of the Father that he had learned to love, that he knew by personal experience, and his Father resurrected him. What does all of this have to say to us? Listen, folks. We're in this nice place. I'm in a real nice room. I enjoy my, you know, I enjoy my cell phone, my iPhone, the newest one. <laughs> all of the gadgets and all the advantages and all the conveniences. But you know what? All of this is very soon going to come crashing down. And we are going to go through the same experience as Jesus. Listen to this remarkable statement found in the Review and Herald, April 14, 1896. We are going to go over the same ground as Jesus. There Ellen White explains, the forces of darkness will unite with human agents who have given themselves into the control of Satan. And the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. Did you catch that? She says the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be re revived. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will be transformed into fiends. The word fiend means an evil spirit or a demon or a very wicked or cruel person. And she continues saying, and those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and glorify their creator, will become the habitation of dragons, and Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil, men who reflect his own image. If we're alive, we're going to go through the same experience. Jesus died with nothing, not even his clothes. Satan is going to try and convince God's people that their sins are too great to be forgiven. Have you ever read the chapter on the time of trouble? That they will never see God's reconciling face. Ellen White says that as God's people think about the past, their hopes begin to sink. But then like Jesus, they will, they will say, Father, we know you. We know you from personal experience. Even though we feel that you'll never accept us, that we'll never see your face, we trust in your promises. You see, God's people are going to lose everything. We'll follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We won't be able to trust our emotions, our feelings, human friendships, family ties, material possessions, or even a feeling of the presence of God. God's people will have no human support. It will appear that they don't even have the support of God. 
but they will overcome. Amen. Not because of what they feel or what they think, but because they know God and they trust in His promises. Amen. Like Job, which is a typological book. It really is a book that describes this time of trouble that God's people will go through. Like Job, God's people will say, though He slay me, yet will I trust in Him. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in my flesh I will see God. In Great Controversy 6.21, Ella White explains about God's people during this period, their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them. But the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. God's love for His children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. But it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. Do you want to have that experience? Do you want to have that experience? I ask again. Yes. Are we willing to invest the necessary resources for this to happen? No, basically it takes three things. An intense life of prayer. Secondly, a careful study of God's Word. And number three, going out and experiencing what Jesus experienced in witnessing to others. That's the way in which we form a personal relationship, a personal link with Jesus. So that when crunch time comes, when the trials come, even though we don't feel like God is with us, we know He is because we have learned to trust Him in times of relative prosperity. I'm going to ask you this evening, if you want me to have a special prayer for the Lord to give you that kind of commitment, that you will take a stand, that you'll stand this evening as we have a word of prayer. This army of youth has power in the hands of God to help finish God's work in this world. Let's form that relationship with the Lord so that it can be a reality. And Jesus can come soon. I'm tired of living in this sin-sick world, are you? It's time to go home. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Father, for being willing to send Jesus, your beloved Son. We know that it was difficult for you to do so. But we thank you that you were willing to make this great sacrifice to send him, not so that he could be one of us for a season, but forever. We also thank Jesus for what he was willing to come and do. Father, we want that personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. Oh Lord, as we go back to our rooms this evening, help us to reflect upon these things. Give us the spirit of prayer, the spirit of study of your holy word, that we might fall in love with your holy word. And Father, help us to see in the faces of others a candidate for the kingdom of heaven. For Jesus loved them. And as his followers, we must love them too. Thank you, Father, for being with us and for answering our prayer. For we ask it, the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.